distinguished guests, participants, colleagues from the MANO, and representatives of the media. Let me start with uh, congratulations. Urdu University, I think, is the right university to discuss about the role of language universities and the role of ODL. Urdu University is the, in terms of the number of students, the largest language university in this country. Of the 19 language universities in the country, this university has the largest number of students. And this is also one of the best universities which is offering education programs through both media, both the conventional and distance education. And Hyderabad is the right place to discuss about the role of language universities because it has, Hyderabad itself has three language universities out of the 19 language universities in the country. Hyderabad itself has three language universities. One is Urdu University, another is Telugu University, and another is English and Foreign Languages University also. And your Vice Chancellor is heading two language universities also. It is also another distinction. It is a rare distinction. You see, the, he is heading the two language universities also. So I would like to congratulate this uh, university for this purpose. I also would like to thank the university for giving me this opportunity. As uh, I think it is Aristotle who said, speaking is an exercise in learning. When I am asked to speak in this forum, it also is a part of, it also helped me to learn many things. First time I realized that there are 19 language universities in the country. And of this, 12 are of Sanskrit uh, language universities in the country. And there are language universities for Urdu, Hindi, Telugu, Tamil, Kannada, Arabic and Persian, English and foreign language universities. These are uh, of the 516 universities in the country, 19 are language universities. Then the question comes, what is the mandate of these language universities and how ODL is related to this mandate. The mandate of language universities, as you know, India, a multilingual country, hundreds of languages and thousands of dialects. Indian constitution, eighth schedule of the constitution, recognizes 22 official languages. And the Urdu University has another distinction of these language universities. If you see the target population of the language universities, Urdu University has a target population of 52 million Urdu-speaking people in the country. According to the 2001 census, it may be more now, Urdu University has the largest target population. This is also a distinction of this university. These language universities, to me, broadly, there are two important functions of all language universities. One is promote and develop languages and culture. This is a broad function of all the language universities. And the second function is provide education and training in all areas of knowledge, technical, vocational, general, all areas of knowledge through the native medium to the specified target groups. There is a specified target group and they're expected to provide education through the medium, native medium. These two functions all the language universities are engaged in it. And uh, naturally, Professor Iqbal Ahmad also rightly emphasized the importance of uh, addressing the needs of these target groups and weaker sections. But at the same time, we also enter into the situation of, in India, as you know, the diversity in the educational institutions. But large number, the, the dominant mode of education in Indian higher education is through the English medium. And also, market also are what we call as the global market, global requirements also favor English medium. But when you are offering education through the local medium or the native language, they have to face the problem of how do you compete in the market? How do you compete globally? How do you make your livelihood when you are earning, when you are learning 
through the local medium. This problem of the medium and the employment opportunities, the medium and the livelihood opportunities is a real serious problem. I am not entering into the debate whether language universities are necessary or not. That debate can be done in a different forum or a different context. But what I am concerned is the language universities are there for different reasons. They have a justification also. But how do you make best of these language universities is our concern. Not to raise the question whether it is necessary or not. They are there. When you have the 19 language universities, when there is a Urdu national university is established, it has a social purpose. It has a purpose of uh, providing educational opportunities to the particular sections of the community. You have to combine the advantages of a language university and also the requirements, social requirements of employment or social requirements of livelihoods. Probably one way of looking at it is the language universities also may also impart multilingual skills. The multilingual skills, particularly in the English language skills. I understand when Professor Patan was here and Professor Muhammad Mia and all the language universities also are taking care of how you also develop English language skills to the students who are taking education through the native languages. This is the one of the concerns of all language universities and language universities are addressing this question in different ways. But the language university are all types of universities, 516 universities in the country. As a university, they have the common vision. As an educational institution, they have the common vision. This common vision, very brilliantly, very succinctly put by Maulana Ajar in the convocation address, I think in the 1951, Aligarh Muslim University convocation address, he, has, he said, I quote, the education set up for a secular and democratic state must be secular. It should provide to all citizens of the state same type of education without any distinction. It should have its own intellectual flavor and its own national character. It should have as its aim the ideal of human progress and prosperity. I think this is the vision of education and this vision of education is equally applicable to the language universities and to the technical universities or to all types of universities. So the, the challenge faced by the language universities is how do you integrate this vision in all their activities? It is the challenge. And I am also very happy the universities like Urdu University is also engaged in term of education. When we are looking to the ODL, Open and Distance Learning, see the Commonwealth of Learning by studying the experience of all the 54 Commonwealth countries Sir John Daniel, the president of the Commonwealth of Learning, has drawn some conclusions about the concerns of governments in all these countries, particularly in all developing countries. The governments are concerned about how do you provide access to be as wide as possible. This is one concern. The second concern is how do you provide quality education, quality, to be as high as possible. The third concern is cost. How do you provide education to be as low as possible, cost-wise as low as possible? These are the three concerns in the education sector. It is considered open and distance learning is a more appropriate way to achieve these objectives of education. In all the countries, Professor Iqbal Ahmad rightly said about the equity question. In all the countries, this question of equity, this question of access, this question of quality, this question of cost. Open and distance learning is considered as the, one of the best ways of achieving these things. I think when I was listening to the Professor Iqbal Ahmad, I thought that uh, he has already given the keynote address. You see, the, I have very little more to say. But let me, as a person who is associated with the distance education for more than three decades in various capacities, some of the questions are bothering me. I would like to share some of these questions with all the participants where you can also reflect on these uh, questions. I just list, listed, you see, the, for, you see the, for discussion purposes, these questions under the four headings. One is, let me start with, when we are talking about the open and distance learning, what is the purpose of open and distance learning? You may be wondering, after 50 years, 1962, Delhi University started first the correspondence courses. 
after almost 50 years, if you are raising the question of the purpose, you may be wondering what is happening to this man who may be 50 years behind. But what is the purpose? Why it is agitating me is, as you know, in 62 or in 82, Ambedkar Open University or 85, Indira Gandhi National Open University, broadly we think two important objectives of ODL is, one is to increase the access or to broaden the access, provide higher education opportunities to large numbers. This is one. The second objective is help the working population to improve their skills, knowledge, qualifications, and abilities. These are the two objectives. But today when I see that many institutions, universities, public and private universities and agencies engaged in the distance education, I find a contradiction between what is the stated objective and what is the real objective. Sometimes the stated objective, every institution say that this is the stated objective. We want to provide more education and education for the people who are working. But there is an unstated objective. Unfortunately, I find many institutions are more interested, how do you make money out of ODL? Make it a more a commercial activity. You may call it as mobilized resources or you may call it mobilize the surplus. But this contradiction between the stated objective and the real objective, if that is the stated objective on real objective, if it is one, there is no problem. But if there is a contradiction, this contradiction results in contradiction in the policies of the institutions. Today we find the distance education system being used for providing sometimes all types of educational opportunities, sometimes of very, very low quality. When thousands of people are admitted for the research programs, the people are raising all sorts of questions about the legitimacy of the distance education system. This is because the real objective may be different from what is the stated objective. So the first question, we have to be clear about the objective and there should not be a contradiction between the real objective and the stated objective. If there is a contradiction, the policies will result in contradictions. I may share some time back, I think it may be 15, 20 years back, as the director of distance education, I visited Patiala University, Punjabi University Patiala. There, at that time, the debate in the, within the campus, the distance education center, is one of the very, you see the, uh, in a sense, large number of students were there in the distance education center. They were debating, you see, finance officer and the registrars, they are objecting for the payment to the uh, printer because he has not followed the guidelines of the, so many lines are to be there in the page. So much is this, the margins, see these things. Then the director of distance education council says that no sir, we wanted less number of lines in the page, we want a bigger font size to be used, but the registrar and finance officer are not agreeing because if you use the bigger font size and more space, it will be more pages and more costly also. So the whole debate is on how to reduce the cost which they are concerned about and how to save the money. But they are not able to appreciate that the font size has a pedagogic value. The margin size has a pedagogic value. These are all the pedagogic tools, you see. That's why, for what purpose you are offering the distance education program? If you are offering distance education program to make money, your policies will be different, your approaches will be different, your responses will be different. So the, my first question is, we still continue to debate and say that there should not be any contradiction between the stated and the real objectives of offering the ODL programs. The second question I would like to raise is, as you know, in from 62 or in earlier also in 69 British Open University also, earlier the emphasis of ODL is more on the access. I think we have to give equal emphasis in the ODL. What is the, how do you ensure the success in ODL? Access is good, it is necessary. But how do you ensure the success in ODL? Unfortunately, the experience of the ODL institution show that the success rate is very low in many programs. This is all what is happening. You may call it as a dropout rate or you may call it a success rate. The success rate is very low. How do you increase the success rate? That means what type of services, what type of uh, student support services you have to engage in? This is the another important question I think you have to address. How do you ensure the success of ODL students? The third question which you have to address is, how do you make the system of ODL more relevant to the needs and aspirations of the target groups? How do you make it more relevant to the needs and aspirations of the target group? Here comes what we call as the program planning activities. I think the universities like Indira Gandhi National Open University has the planning units, and there's a need for conducting what we call as the need analysis and need studies and 
designing the programs based on the need analysis. It is also necessary to evolve the right type of uh, teaching and learning strategies also. Right type of curriculum, how do you develop the curriculum? Because you have to take into consideration the target groups. Generally, a debate is, uh, is there in the, dis in the education field. What type of programs can be offered through the distance mode? My answer to this question is, all types of programs can be offered through the distance mode. But it requires two conditions. One is, the students must be prepared to learn through the distance mode. There is a different type of a preparedness to learn through the distance mode. British Open Institute is offering the nuclear physics also through the distance mode. You can offer any program. But the question is, are the students prepared to learn through the distance mode? Second question is, institutions must adopt appropriate teaching learning strategies. What are those appropriate teaching learning strategies? Then the institution must decide. Experts in the field must decide. So the teaching learning strategies are very, very important. The program planning is very, very important. Mix of the media is very, very important. And today, many developments are taking place in the form of open educational resources and in the use of technology also. When you are trying to use the technology, naturally, the technology has to be used based on the four A's. These four A's are availability of technology, acceptability of technology, affordability of technology, and appropriateness of technology. These are all the questions which you have to discuss and say that this particular program requires this type of a technology. This particular program requires this type of a curriculum. So there is a need for critically examining all these aspects, making it relevant to the target group for which you are designing the programs. This is the third question. Let me raise one question, one more question. The fourth question is, I am really wondering, do we have an integrated policy and operational framework for ODL in the country. The Distance Education Council is the right body to address to these questions. They are doing it. They are doing a good job, wonderful job, and I am very happy. But my own con is, when we are looking at the ODL policies, I will give two examples here. When I am saying there is a need for integrated policy, that integrated policy of education must have respect for all the media, all the mediums whether it is a native medium or English medium, all the modes, whether it is a conventional mode or a distance mode, equal respect to all. That policy must have that equal respect. If you see the policy, two examples I will give. I think the deck also is concerned about these questions. I, I, see the, I came across a circular from the Distance Education Council, recently circular, director has shown me, saying that the dual mode universities when they are offering the distance education programs they have to mention that mode on their certification that means a student studied through the distance mode i think it is the, the circular type of circular is issued if you see that circular how you relate this circular this policy frame we are also talking about what we call as a convergence of the modes we are also talking of allowing the students transfer from one mode of education to another mode some programs they may do through the distance mode, some programs they may do conventional mode. That also we are talking about our policies. We are talking about a credit transfer. We are talking about all these policies. How it is contradicting with this particular policy framework? This is the one we have to look into. Or sometimes, you see, in the, I think 2009, UGC has issued a circular stating that research programs cannot be offered through the distance mode. This is a circular of UGC. There is a history and all those things about the quality and all those things I can understand. But the question is, if you are looking at from the kind of the quality, there is a compromise in quality even in the conventional systems research programs also. Maybe there is a compromise in the quality of a distance education research programs also. What should be the response? Response should be design a appropriate uh, regulations and systems whether for conventional or distance education, you have to follow these regulations if you want to offer the distance education programs, but not banning. Why I am exam giving these examples is there is a need for having an integrated policy and operational framework. And this operational framework must be a flexible operational framework and, and which gives autonomy to the institutions. These are the, some of the concerns. You see, as you know, these are the, some of the concerns. These are the, some of the questions which are agitating me Probably I have followed what we call as a Socratic method of raising some questions. Maybe as Socrates said, raising questions 
sometimes is more important than finding answers. We have to find answers. Not that uh, I have any takeaway solutions. Suppose sometimes, as you know, pe people in the experts uh, in the field, some of the people are called as an experts. They say that, uh, what are the, the solutions for this problem? We have the problem. If you can give a solution, you are considered as an expert. I am not an expert in that way. Peter Drucker said, who is a consultant? Consultant is one who is ignorant of the problem, but at the same time has the capacity to raise the right questions. So we are raising some right questions. It is for us, you see, all of us, to examine it. I just would like to conclude. You see, this is because this is a, a very good exercise, as uh, Confucius said. It is an exercise in finding wisdom. I quote Confucius, by three methods we may learn wisdom. First, by reflection, which is noblest. Second, by imitation, which is easiest. And third, by experience, which is the bitterest. I hope you enjoy the fruits of the bitter experiences of all of you. Thank you very much.